Hello and welcome to Boston. Boston is one of the world's greatest destinations and I'd love you to experience Boston as Bostonians do. So please stop by our Visitor Information Center on Boston Common or at Prudential Center where you can pick up brochures and maps, get information about the tours that Boston has to offer, and get to experience Boston in a really enjoyable way. We look forward to your stay in Boston. There is no other way to see Boston's North End than by foot. This way, you have no choice but to immerse yourself in the heady aromas, the captivating sights, the delightful sounds of European-American village life. As you stroll down the narrow and winding streets, stop at a cafe for a cappuccino, gelato, or cannoli, and you'll know why this neighborhood is famous. The North End is the city's oldest residential area, and it houses architecture from all periods of American history. The new slogan is, My North End Boston. For true Revolutionary War buffs, you have to see the Old North Church, Paul Revere's house, and the magnificent views of the USS Constitution. The charisma of the North End comes from its people. It has always been a home to immigrant populations. In the past, it has housed centers of Irish and Jewish life. Today, the character of the North End is undeniably Italian. The food is to die for. Italian cuisine is like the wine it so prizes. It derives its inimitability from the earth from which it springs. And if you're planning your own meal, don't miss the North End's bakers, wine merchants, green grocers, and salumeria. If you're looking for fresh mozzarella, prosciutto, or those hard to find ingredients, stop by. You're bound to find it. You absolutely have to get some of the renowned pastries, the warm, crusty breads, or my favorite, gelato. There you go. Thank you. But while you're here, sit down and enjoy the company. You'll be glad you did. Modern pastry, 150 years of old world tradition. A degree of distinction that can never be archaic. Also available online at modernpastry.com. Welcome to the Old North Church, one of the most historic places in America, one of the places where the American Revolution began. Hello, my name is William Dawes. Uh, you may not have heard of me before, but uh, I was one of the folks who rode along with Paul Revere to alarm the countryside on the first night of our revolution, April 18th of 75. But there were other men involved, a man named Robert Newman, for instance, who was the sexton of the Old North Church. One if by land, two if by sea. Ever heard of that before? Well, Robert Newman was the man who made that happen with these two lanterns upstairs in the high steeple of this church. Let's go see it right now. Paul Revere had made a prior arrangement with Robert Newman to hang lanterns in the tower of the Old North Church if the British invaded the countryside. Newman had to escape his home where there were British soldiers in the downstairs area in order to do it. But on the night in question, he was climbing the stairs into the tall steeple, lanterns in hand. We're only two stories up of 14. We've got a long way to go. This is the bell ringing chamber. Paul Revere was a bell ringer here as a young boy, and that's how he became acquainted with the excellent view of the countryside from the tall steeple. Come on, we still got a ways to go. And here we are at last. You know, this would have been a lot more difficult at night for Robert Newman, but here we are and the steeple of the Old North Church with a panoramic view of Boston all around. If you look off in that direction, you can see the masts of the USS Constitution. That's Charlestown. That's where they were looking for the lanterns in 1775. These are the windows from which Robert Newman would have hung his two lanterns on the night of April 18th of 1775. They were only up for a few minutes, but that was long enough. The message got through to Charlestown that the American Revolution had begun. When you come to Beacon Hill, you feel like you've gone back through time. Perpetually burning gas street lamps shine down upon red brick walkways, brass door knockers, window boxes, flowering pear trees, and hidden gardens. Charles Street 
brims with 40 antique shops, fantastic restaurants, delicious food shops, and beautiful boutiques of home decor. The Massachusetts State House, with its beautiful dome, is at the top of the hill, overlooking Boston Common. And for you sitcom lovers, there's a pub formerly known as the Bull and Finch, after Charles Bullfinch, the venerable architect responsible for so much of Boston's character. But it was only renamed after the popular program was canceled. So, come to Beacon Hill, where we may not all know your name, but at least you can lift a glass with us and be welcome. Cheers. Blue Man Group. The show that brings you moments like this. And this. And makes you feel like this. Blue Man Group gives you this. As well as this. And you'll feel like this. The show that gives you this. And this. And makes you feel as happy as this. Come see Blue Man Group at the Charles Playhouse in Boston. A mere stone's throw away from the North End in Faneuil Hall, you will find a place of wonders from a different world. The New England Aquarium is built around a four-story, 200,000-gallon Caribbean coral reef exhibit called the Giant Ocean Tank. 560-pound sea turtles Toothy sharks and huge stingrays peer out at you as you circle their home. More than 750 species and 40,000 animals live at the aquarium. Both harbor and fur seals have training sessions several times a day that you can watch. More than 60 penguins of three different species fly underwater through one of the largest penguin exhibits in North America. Thousands of sea jellies will surprise you with their beauty. The IMAX Theatre has state-of-the-art 3D technology and the largest movie screen in New England at over 65 feet high. Come to the New England Aquarium and maybe you'll be able to make some new friends too. Lana, kiss! Just 25 miles east of Boston is America's only whale feeding sanctuary, Stellwagen Bank. New England Aquarium has one of the best whale watches in Boston. Stellwagen Bank. The ocean floor rises from 300 feet below sea level to 100. Water surges upwards, minerals come with it, and animals feed. The biggest animals ever to live on Earth. This feeding ground sits at the mouth of Massachusetts Bay. For the adventurous, close enough to get to by boat, launching from the New England Aquarium, who else would you want to take you? This high-speed catamaran is specifically built for whale watching, with plenty of room outside for everyone watching the whales and plenty of room inside if the sun or weather are too much. The cruises run from April through October, giving you plenty of opportunity for this encounter between man and the mysterious sea. Hi there, my name is Melissa, and I'm here to tell you whether you're fun, flirty, sassy, or laid back, Boston's nightlife is what you crave. I'm here to show you Boston's hottest spots. Whether it be enjoying a Fenway Frank at a baseball game, or sipping a signature teeny at one of the trendy lounges in Boston's Back Bay, Boston's nightlife possibilities are endless. For a more relaxed mood, kick back and grab a beer at a local bar. Listen to a live band and play some pool. Beantown also offers a wide variety of musical theater and dance art. Take it from a Boston baby who was born and bred here. Boston nightlife is where it's at. Come on, let's go. You're watching the Boston Hotel Channel. City Buzz Boston. For more information on anything you've seen on this program, visit our website, visitorstvnetwork.com, where you can view all of the video for this city as well as all of the other cities in our network and link directly to the attraction's website and get more information such as the restaurant menus, the local weather forecast, calendar of events, and directions from your hotel. All this and more at visitorstvnetwork.com. I'm standing next to the United States Frigate Constitution. She was launched in 1797 from the yard of Edmund Hart here in Boston. She fought the French in the Quasi War. She fought the Barbary Corsairs in the Mediterranean. And she defended America in the War of 1812. It was in the War of 1812 that she earned her most famous victories. 
Off the coast of Nova Scotia, she encountered His Majesty's ship Guerriere. It was during that battle that American sailors saw British cannonballs bouncing off the sides of Constitution. The sailors called out, Huzzah! Her sides are made of iron, and hence her nickname, Old Ironsides. Her name was selected by President George Washington. He wanted this ship named after the document that governs our nation. She has never been beaten in battle. She is the oldest commissioned warship afloat in the world. And she is here in Boston, one of America's great treasures. Hi there, and welcome to Boston. If you're going to enjoy a favorite local dish, fresh Maine lobster, you're gonna to need to know what to do. Before digging in, be sure to fasten your lobster bib. Thank you. Here we have boiled lobster, served in classic New England style. Now for the best part. To open your lobster, start by grabbing your claw and twisting it and pulling it away to remove it from the body. Next, take your claw crackers, placing the lobster claw in between and squeezing until it cracks. Next, pick up the lobster by the tail, unfurl it and twist to separate from the body. Break off the lobster tail flipper and using your lobster fork, stick it under the lobster shell and pull to pull the meat out of the shell. With the claw already cracked, take your lobster fork, remove the smaller claw, peel apart your shell and pull the meat out. Finally, dip your meat in your dish of warm drawn butter. Bon appetit. Mm. That is how you open a lobster in Boston without looking like a tourist. World renowned for over four decades, Anthony's Pier 4 is essential for those who want to taste the local flavor and seafood Boston is famous for. Guests enjoy dazzling views of Boston Harbor while enjoying traditional New England dishes and inventive international cuisine, including lobsters from Anthony's own lobster company in Maine, fine cuts of meat and seafood grilled on our open hearth, an award-winning wine list and cocktail menu, fabulous dessert such as Grand Marnier Souffle, and of course, Anthony's famous popovers. Come discover what locals, visitors, and celebrities have long known. For the freshest seafood, come to the pier. Anthony's Pier 4. You've never been to Boston before. You may never have heard of Newbury Street. Well, that is where we are, right here in the middle of Boston's historic Back Bay. Newbury Street has been touted as the Rodeo Drive of the East, and it has everything from high-end fashion stores to small boutiques, from little cafes to beautiful spas and salons. Now it serves as Boston's representative of fashion and style, on par with San Francisco, LA, and New York. The street is home to an eclectic mix of independent shops, high-end fashion, dining establishments, and art galleries. For the city's salon and hairstyle industry, there is no other location. Shops are upscale towards the public garden and more modest down towards Mass Ave. To tell you the truth, Newbury Street has a little something for everyone. Come on, let's go. Playing in an orchestra is all about teamwork and precision, and the conductor is really the coach of that team. My job up there is to bring all these individual artists into the same place at the same time and create something that's the greater than the sum of our individual parts. When I'm conducting, I really, I'm not thinking about anything other than the music, not thinking about the people around you, not thinking about what kind of day you've had, only thinking about making great music. And when you're doing that, you know you're having a great concert.
Boston Pops is one of this country's oldest cultural institutions. It's almost a century and a quarter old. We call ourselves America's Orchestra because this is really an orchestra that has a constituency that goes far beyond Boston, far beyond New England, to all of America and the rest of the world. I think it's really the orchestra that plays the most exciting mix of music from, from all cultures, from all walks of life, from Broadway, from jazz, world music, and of course the great classics written for symphony orchestra. And we just think that we're the greatest combination of art and entertainment that you can ever find in an orchestra concert. In December 1773, a group of Bostonians determined to resist the acts of Parliament that taxed the tea, threw chests of tea into Boston Harbor. In London, the news of the Boston Tea Party was met with horror. Parliament decided and the King's ministers decided that Bostonians must be punished. And so the Port of Boston was closed. A general, General Gage, was sent here to bring order. British troops, the dreaded redcoats, were sent as well. Things were tense in Boston in 1774. Early in 1775, matters grew even more grave. The Massachusetts Provincial Congress left Boston. They were meeting in Concord under the leadership of Samuel Adams and John Hancock. General Gage here in Boston was determined to take control. He was particularly alarmed when he heard that munitions, cannons, gunpowder were being gathered in the town of Concord to outfit the Massachusetts militia, the Minutemen. And so, on the evening of the 18th of April, 1775, 800 British soldiers gathered here at the foot of Boston Common to prepare to cross the Charles River to make their march on Lexington and Concord. They crossed quietly, but not without notice. For the Boston Committee of Safety knew that the British were on the march tonight, and they dispatched two messengers, Paul Revere and William Dawes, to alarm the countryside that the regulars were out tonight. Well, the regulars did cross the Charles. They landed in Cambridge, and they began their march towards Lexington and Concord. By now, of course, the secret march was a secret no more. The entire countryside was alarmed. Revere and Dawes carried the message to every Middlesex village and farm. As the British marched out towards Lexington, they could hear bells sounding in the distance. They could hear alarm guns going off. They knew that the Americans knew the regulars were out. In Lexington, Captain John Parker summoned his company of militia to stand and be ready for the British. They gathered on Lexington Green, and they waited and waited. When the British didn't arrive, Captain Parker told his men to stand down, but be ready to assemble again should the alarm sound. Towards dawn, on the morning of the 19th of April, suddenly the news came that the British were not far from the town. William Diamond, a young Lexington drummer, was summoned to tap the drum in alarm. Diamond did his job and Captain Parker's men assembled on Lexington Green. As they approached the Americans, their officers yelled to them, lay down your arms, you damned rebels. In the meantime, Captain Parker told his men, stand firm, don't move. The story has it that Parker told his men, don't fire unless fired upon, but if they mean to have a war, then let it begin here. As the British approached, there was confusion. From a distance, we still don't know how or who or precisely where, but from a distance from behind a stone wall, a shot was fired. That sent the British troops into a panic. They lowered their weapons, fired at the Americans who were standing there, charged with their bayonets. The British officers immediately regained control of their men, but it was too late. Several Americans lay dead on Lexington Green. Others were severely wounded. The British soldiers regrouped, took their arms, and began to huzzah. Three huzzahs for the king. Huzzah! 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 And then they marched off towards the town of Concord, 
leaving the people of Lexington to gather their dead and tend to the wounded. There is a beat underneath the streets of the South End that you will find it impossible not to dance to. The thriving art community will enthrall you and the vibrant population will enchant you. This area attracts a diverse mix of young families and young professionals to its Victorian brownstone buildings and it's sure to pull you in as well. Boston College first opened its doors in the South End in 1863. Now, aside from the many art galleries and artist studios that line its streets, you can also find the Boston Ballet, the Boston Center for the Arts, and Boston University Medical Center. The Speakeasy Theatre Company is the resident theatre company in the Calderwood Pavilion, the first new theatre in Boston in 80 years. Though the restaurants of the district tout a relatively high price point, it's worth it. Tremont Street is sometimes referred to as Restaurant Row. The range of cuisine is staggering and includes American Southern, French, Indian, Italian, Greek, Middle Eastern, Cuban, Brazilian, Thai, and Japanese. The South End's growing retail presence includes a range of shops where you can find stationery, men's and women's clothing, and home furnishings. Boston is regarded as an Irish city, and both Irish and American visitors alike consider Boston to be the Irish capital of America. You aren't here long before realizing the deep Irish roots that run through Boston's illustrious history. Logan Airport, the Callaghan Tunnel, the McCormack, Kennedy and Moakley Federal buildings, plus numerous parks, boulevards and memorials attest to the Irish presence in Boston. One of the most treasured memorials in Boston is the Irish Famine Memorial, here at the junctions of Washington and Milk Streets. It was unveiled in 1998 to commemorate the 150th anniversary of Ireland's Great Hunger in the 1840s. Irish have been settling in Boston since the early 18th century and have put their distinctive mark on the city's politics, business, culture and social life. Today, Irish culture is enjoyed and appreciated by Boston residents and visitors and groups like U2, Van Morrison, the Irish Tenors, Riverdance and the Chieftains have loyal followings. Boston has an old world charm combined with a contemporary sensibility that visitors enjoy and seek out. Thank you. The art of hospitality, perfected in Ireland, is part of the ongoing tradition of the Irish coming to Boston and adding their considerable talents to this great city. Boston is rich in history, including African American history. In 1863, the city hosted the 54th Regiment, the first all-black volunteer regiment to fight for the United States Army. You can learn more about the 54th Regiment and other aspects of Boston's black history on the Black Heritage Trail. It's a 1.5 mile walking tour of Beacon Hill, where we look at homes of uh, blacks in Boston and abolitionist history in Boston as well. There's also a timeline inside the museum that details information about black professional organizations and blacks participation in the whaling industry and shipping industry as well. There's also artifacts for the 54th Regiment like Robert Goldshaw's sword and a bust of Robert Goldshaw. Uh, the museum is open from 10 to 4 every day of the week except for Sundays. On June 16, 1775, 1,200 American militia marched from Cambridge to come to Charlestown to build a fortification on Bunker's Hill. Their orders were to build a formidable place to drive the British out of Boston. The British immediately decided that they needed to be moved off that hill. 2,000 British soldiers came over from Boston, marched up the slope of this hill. As they were marching up, the American commander, Colonel Prescott, told his men, don't fire. Don't fire until you see the whites of their eyes. As they drew near, Colonel Prescott commanded, volley, fire. The British soldiers went down in windrows, back reeling down the hill. They came up a second time. Again, Prescott told his men, hold your fire, hold your fire. They came close, the Americans fired again. And for a second time, the British retreated down the hill. They came up a third time. By this time, the Americans had run short of ammunition. 
The British came over the redoubt and drove the Americans off the hill. Nearly 450 Americans fell that day. More than twice that number of British soldiers died. The British crowed about their victory at Bunker's Hill, causing an American general, Nathaniel Green, to comment, fine, he said, we'll sell them hills at that price anytime. Among those who were witnessing the battle at Bunker Hill was Abigail Adams at home in Braintree. Now, it was Breed's Hill. It wasn't Bunker's Hill. There was a confusing there because it is understood that perhaps the British had the wrong map with the wrong name of the hill. So what is known as the Battle of Bunker's Hill is actually on Breed's Hill. And the great monument called the Bunker Hill Monument is actually on the wrong hill. The cornerstone laid by the Marquis de Lafayette was in 1825. They finished building the monument in 1843. It is 221 feet high and it is open to the public. You're watching the Boston Hotel Channel, City Buzz Boston. For more information on anything you've seen on this program, visit our website, visitorstvnetwork.com, where you can view all of the video for this city as well as all of the other cities in our network and link directly to the attraction's website and get more information such as the restaurant menus, the local weather forecast, calendar of events, and directions from your hotel. All this and more at Visitors TV. In 1822, after nearly 200 years of being a town, the people of Boston voted to become a city. In the first mayoral election, Josiah Quincy ran for office. He lost. The next year, he ran again. This time, he won. Mr. Quincy had a vision for Boston. He was particularly interested in Dock Square, the area in front of Faneuil Hall. It was a dirty, mucky place filled with oyster shells and dead cats. Mr. Quincy decided that this would be the place where a new market should be built. Alexander Paris was the architect. Mr. Paris designed a magnificent granite structure. The building was opened and almost immediately it became known as Quincy's Market. Over the 19th century, Quincy's Market began to deteriorate. It too fell into disrepair. By the mid part of the 20th century, it was a pretty sad sight here. But then came the American Revolution Bicentennial. And in this town, an architect named Thompson and a developer named Rouse teamed up together to renovate and restore Quincy Market. With the aid of the mayor, Kevin White, this place magically reappeared. The market area was refurbished and restored and became what it is today, one of the central features of our town. Standing here in front of Faneuil Hall, 1742, Quincy Market is today what this area was always meant to be. The marketplace, the commercial center of this town. Boston and Cambridge are home to more college students than any other city in the United States. We're here at the MIT Museum today in Cambridge, which showcases many of the contributions made by MIT to this region and to the world. The most famous professor, perhaps, at MIT is a man by the name of Harold Edgerton. We call him Doc. And what Edgerton contributed was an entirely new way of seeing the world. He took a 19th century innovation called the stroboscope, and it use that light, that flash of light, to see the invisible. Here's a flow of water. Looks like a steady stream. Now let's turn on the strobe light. And all of a sudden, you can see it's like magic. You can see that a stream of water isn't solid, but in fact made up of droplets. You can even try this out yourself. Ready? Here we're looking at Machine with Wishbone. It's an amazing creation of Arthur Ganson, an artist who's long been an artist in residence here at MIT. He sat in the labs, talked with the students, with the faculty, professors, learned what they did, and then went back into his own shop and created these amazing, whimsical, funny, curious creations. He helps the students here, the faculty, and anyone, frankly, love and learn and think about creativity. 
And that's at the essence of technology and one of the most important things that we teach here at MIT. Well, Kismet, one of our newest additions, and I would like to thank you for visiting the MIT Museum. You can see many other innovations here at the museum, and we're open six days a week, Tuesday to Sunday, and we're located at 265 Massachusetts Avenue. Peter Faneuil was an orphan. He was raised by his uncle Andrew, wealthy merchant in the town of Boston. When uncle Andrew died, he left his entire estate to his nephew Peter on a condition. The condition was that Peter must never marry. Peter agreed to the condition, and he became known in Boston as the Jolly Bachelor. Boston needed a new marketplace. Peter Faneuil built this building and presented it to the people of the town. In gratitude for his generosity, they named it after him, Faneuil Hall. This became the central market for Boston. It was also the place where the town meeting met. It was here in this great hall that Samuel Adams spoke in favor of revolution. It was here that John Hancock presided, that Joseph Warren, James Otis, and dozens of other patriots, high sons of liberty, spoke in the cause of the American Revolution. After the revolution, the people of Boston needed a larger hall, and so they turned to their architect, Charles Bullfinch, and in 1805, this hall was enlarged. Later in the 19th century, this place, known affectionately as the Cradle of Liberty, became the scene for abolitionist speeches. Here in this chamber, the great heroic abolitionist spoke in defiance of the laws to denounce the evil of slavery. It was here that William Lloyd Garrison spoke, Charles Sumner, and Frederick Douglass. This hall remains today a site for meetings for free speech. It remains today an important part of Boston's historic fabric. From the grasshopper weather vane on the cupola above to this great hall, this is one of our town's great icons. This hall is still owned by the city of Boston. It is free and open to the public every day, and tours are available from ranges of the National Park Service.